Welcome! Today we're going to be talking about the spread of pathogens. And when we're looking at the spread of pathogens, one of the things we want to make sure we understand is our purpose. I want you to understand the role of microorganisms in disrupting the health of other organisms. So why should we care? Why is this something you know that we should worry about? I mean, besides all the plagues throughout history, um, things we know that have happened recently in localized areas, People are still dealing with malaria and I mean, Ebola and stuff like that. Currently in our reality, we're dealing with COVID-19, which is a novel coronavirus. We haven't seen this strain uh, before. In understanding the disease itself, the thing that's causing it, the virus, understanding how it spreads and how to control that is going to be the key to fighting all the misinformation and the panic that we're seeing. So really understand Standing infectious diseases is going to be the key to making sure that we can um, control that. So what is a pathogen? A pathogen is simply defined as any microorganism or virus that can cause an infectious disease. So microorganisms such as bacteria, protists, and fungi, you can see my little um, bacteria right here. And um, bacteria come in all different shapes, not all different shapes, three different shapes. But they come in different shapes and they're so slightly different, but um, they many of them can cause diseases. Viruses can also be pathogens. However, they're not included under microorganisms because they're not actually living organisms. And when we talk about infection disease, infectious disease, we want to be clear that we're talking about one that is caused by microorganisms or a virus, like cold or strep, but not things like diabetes, those are non-infectious diseases, and those are linked to lifestyle, things in the environment, or gene mutations. So infectious versus non-infectious, we're focusing on infectious diseases. And there are four groups of pathogens that we can look at. First, we're gonna start with bacteria. They are prokaryotic, so you can see in our little picture here, have this little bundle of DNA found in the center. There's some differences between them. Some have cell walls, some don't. Um, but there's this wide variety, but what happens when they're causing diseases is they're producing toxins. And those toxins, they get secreted by the bacteria or they're released when the bacteria break apart. When this happens, the toxins damage the cells and they cause those infectious diseases. So for example, um, strep throat, cholera, tetanus, you know, stepping on a rusty nail, botulism, which is a form of food poisoning. You might have also heard on your favorite medical drama about necrotizing fasciitis. It's a flesh-eating bacteria. They like to include that on a lot of medical dramas. And those are bacterial diseases. And then we'll move over here to fungi, things, diseases that are caused by a fungus. And these are all going to be eukaryotic. They're also heterotrophic. They're different from plants because they have a cell wall made of chitin instead of cellulose. Now, when we think of fungi, we often think of like mushrooms. You can find them on the ground after it rains or in the store. But we also have other types of fungus. There's also single cell fungi, and they can make us sick as well. And they can cause disease in three different ways. First, some produce toxins. They protect themselves, but if we eat those, it's poisonous to us. Second, and this is one you've probably, you know, this is what the picture is showing. You've probably heard of this too. They can be parasites. They not only take nutrients from the host, but they're also invading nearby tissues. So you can see right here, and this is a picture of ringworm, which is not actually a worm. It's like it's kind of scaly and crusty in there. And this is a fungus and it's feeding on um, the person or a person's skin. It's taking nutrients, invading tissues. It'll keep growing if not treated. The last way these make us sick is some mold spores can actually cause allergic reactions, and those re reactions can actually be quite severe and life-threatening. So examples, you probably, besides ringworm, you've probably heard of yeast infections and athlete's foot, and those are all fungus. Now, protists, protists belong to the kingdom protista, and it's a very diverse group, but most diseases are going to be caused by protozoa or animal-like protists. These can be spread by a vector, 
you can see right here, a mosquito is an example of a vector. They can also be spread through contaminated food or water. These protozoa become parasites inside the body. They take nutrients while harming the host. Malaria is a great example that most of you have probably heard of. And the vector, this little mosquito, when it bites a person, the parasite enters their bloodstream through the saliva, and then it heads to the liver, and then on out, attacking cells. You can see right here, this cell expands to a point, it's got all the little um, uh, parasites in it, and it expands to the point that it actually damages the cell. It's causing the cell to burst. This causes a lot of damage internally. And then the way this goes from one person to the next is, Another mosquito comes along, feeds on this person's blood. That mosquito picks up the parasite that is in their bloodstream. And then when it goes to bite another person, they drop that off. Obviously not something mosquito needs to do. It's just the vector that is spreading this. Giardia is another example. And this is often found in contaminated water. It's been contaminated with um, feces of some sort. And the parasite enters when people ingest it which sounds like horrific, but you know, everybody's, oh, you're up in the mountains and you see this beautiful clear stream, so you decide to drink when you're hiking, and that beautiful clear stream can actually contain parasites. Just because it's clean does, or clear doesn't mean it's free of parasites. So that's one of the things that they warn you against when hiking. Now, when you're looking at a virus, when you look at the little virus over there, you, it's not a cell. It doesn't have most of the things required to be considered a cell. What it does have is some nucleic acid in here. It's usually DNA or RNA, or it is DNA or RNA, depending on the type of cell or type of virus. It's surrounded by a special protein coat called a capsid. And then some viruses may also be surrounded by this envelope out here. And this envelope actually helps um, to infect the host cells. It's got a little um, structures on it that can help the, it infect the cells. Viruses infect a host cell by injecting their DNA and then they use the host protein making machinery to make new viruses. And then those new viruses, once they're assembled, they break out of the host cell and they go to infect other cells. One of the reasons viruses are not considered alive is because they cannot reproduce on their own. They must have a host cell. Examples you've probably heard of, HIV, chickenpox, flu, COVID-19, one of the coronaviruses and that we're dealing with lately. Now, when we're looking at pathogens, we need to understand how they, in the chain of infection, how are these being passed from individual to individual? It's always going to start this agent, this germ, the germ theory of disease. This germ is going to be in a reservoir. And this reservoir is where the microorganism exists and it's multiplying. It can be another person. It can be a vector like a flea or it can be contaminated food or water or soil. And you have probably heard about the diseases that are transferred from animals to humans. This is called zoonosis. And when humans come in contact with the animals that carry the pathogens, um, it can be transferred to humans. And sometimes that doesn't make the animal reservoir sick, but it does when it's transferred to us. And we see this a lot. And um, please understand, it's not just eating wild animals or consuming them that this can happen. There are other ways that um, those pathogens are transferred to humans. And as we come more in contact with Wild animals, this is just something we can expect to happen. The pathogen has to leave the host. It has to get out through one of these um, ways. It's going to leave. It's going to be carried through bodily fluids, blood, mucus. All these are bodily fluids. Um, and then the mode of trans... Oops, that's not bodily. I have to pay more attention. Bodily... And the mode of transmission can be direct or indirect. Direct is physical contact or spreading through droplets. Physical contact would be touching infected areas, 
kissing, sexual intercourse, eating, or drinking after an infected person. So HIV is spread through sexual intercourse because it's found in the white blood cells um, that are found in uh, the semen and bodily fluid or vaginal fluids of people. They can also be spread through drug use because that blood is being transferred from one person to another. Droplets are spread when a sick person, maybe have the flu, and you sneeze in somebody's direction, and those pathogen-filled droplets go in their direction and are inhaled into the person's lungs. This also happens when you eat or drink after somebody because their saliva has the, those pathogens in it and if they're sick, and that can be transferred to you as well. So here are several examples to go um, to look at. Sorry, wasn't quite done over here. Indirect is when you don't actually have to make contact with an infected person. Airborne diseases such as measles kind of hang out in the air. Um, West Nile and malaria are both spread by vectors. Those mosquitoes go from one to the next. And so however it's being spread, um, one of the things that's important to understand is that pathogens um, have these different ways, but most diseases only spread in one way, not multiple ways. So Ebola is spread through direct contact with bodily fluids. You can't catch it by breathing the same air as a person. Same thing with HIV. So it has to have a way into the body, but most of them have like one way that they move. Um, so pathogens can enter through any opening. It can be a natural opening, like eyes, mouth, nose, penis, or vagina. It can also be an unnatural, like a break in the skin. You have a cut and um, bacteria get in there and cause an infection in your cut. And then this has got become a big thing lately, and I'm not really sure why um, it wasn't before. Hand washing, if we're going to prevent this, hand washing is huge. I mean, I don't know why this pe was people aren't listening for, but um, when you go to the restroom, you want to make sure you wash those bacteria off of your hands. You don't want to rub them into your eye or, you know, go to eat something and get them in your mouth. So we can control some of these by um, a lot of these pathogens just by practicing good hygiene. Wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, before you eat. So whatever you've been touching doesn't go into your mouth with your food. And it's also important to understand proper food handling and cooking temperatures. There was an E. coli problem um, in the 90s because of improper cooking temperatures. So it's important to understand that too. Um, Covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze, you cough into your elbows, so you're not shooting your little, it's not shooting, but spraying your little pathogen filled droplets at another person. And don't avoid contact with people's bodily fluids. Obviously not just like blood and stuff. We have specific ways we're supposed to help clean up blood and vomit. We don't want to just start wiping it up because it can um, pass pathogens, but also things that we don't think of as much, for example, Saliva. I see people drinking after each other all the time. That's a great way to spread stuff that is in your saliva. And there's also controlling insect populations. Um, one of the problems we're struggling with now is are things like West Nile. And part of that is because of mosquitoes. And so if we can control those populations, which is really hard, and that can help. So before you know, I leave off, I want to point out Bacteria, these pathogens, they're not like this group. These groups are not all bad. Not all bacteria, fungi, protists, or viruses are bad. Just some of them are. Some of these are actually essential to humans. So um, fermented foods, bacteria and fungus give us a lot of great fermented foods like yogurt and cheese and kombucha. I love kombucha. And bacteria also aid in digestion. They help you absorb certain nutrients you couldn't. And bacteria and certain fungi can actually help keep bad bacteria in check as well. And we talked about in ecology, protist bacteria and fungi are all essential decomposers. They help to break down and recycle those nutrients. Also, these two groups here, these are some of these are photosynthetic. They produce about half the world's oxygen, not trees, not plants. That photosynthetic bacteria and photosynthetic protists. So think about if we didn't have those. I mean, that's essential to us. And then viruses, they always get a bad name, but I also want you to understand there are viruses that help us in our own bodies. They live in our mucous membranes. 
They help to destroy bacteria. And scientists are actually working on genetically engineering viruses to work for us in certain gene therapies. So, I mean, we think of them as bad and they get a bad reputation, but they do some good in there too. Here's some questions I want you to think of, or think about just some things to kind of, um, as you're thinking about pathogens, here's some follow-up questions. And then I want you to think about what are some other questions that you have? What are some of your unanswered questions? And if you want, you can share them in the comments below, but maybe look some up on your own, you know, head to Google and see what you can find out. All right, have a great day.